And now right into our program, Chris Cosley uh, is uh, going to give us a presentation tonight on the arsenal before it was the arsenal for World War I. So why don't you come up, Chris, and uh, we'll take it from here. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad everybody came out here on this uh, very blustery evening. Yeah, Winter Wonderland. Uh, it, it's nice they turned the lights down for everybody can take a good nap. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I, I am actually a Yankee Air Museum Life member. Uh, it was active here in the past. Uh, I kind of left and formed my own little organization a few years back. Uh, we were doing the Michigan Military Technical and Historical Society. Uh, we focus on uh, Michigan's contribution to 20th century conflict, uh, so Michigan in defense of democracy. Uh, we talk about uh, the role Michigan played in basically in the, from 1900 through today. Uh, there are some brochures and things about our museum over on the uh, tape round table there in the corner. We're located in East Point right off a of nine and a half mile in Gratiot. And, uh, Check out our website. We've, we have our historical presentation series as well. We've got some cool stuff coming up. Uh, January 25th, we're going to have Dan Heaton's going to be talking about uh, Michigan in the Cold War and the, the Nike bases and things like that. And then uh, uh, Charlie Hyde will also be coming to our museum, and he's going to be giving his uh, Rosie the Riveter presentation in, on February 8th, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, that's, my, uh, that's my commercial and my plug. And so without further ado, we'll get into... Uh, Michigan and World War One. Uh, we can kind of skip over this part. We already did this. So I call this dress rehearsal for the arsenal of democracy, Michigan industry in World War One. I'm not sure why it does this. I've been trying to make it stop doing this for a while. But so just a little bit of background. Things you have to consider. Uh, I, looking around the room, I can see that pretty much everybody in here is a product of the United States as a superpower. Everybody here has, has spent the bulk of their life, uh, probably nobody here actually spent part of their life as the United States pre-superpower mode, so pre, you know, post-1945. Uh, at the end of World War II, there's a major shift in, the, in American thinking. You know, in general, you know, Eisenhower would refer to it as the birth of the military industrial complex. The era that we're talking about right now, and you have to get you, put your mind into the into the 1914, the pre-1945 mindset for the United States. The, the founding fathers of this country had a deep-rooted mistrust for a standing army. Uh, most of the students of history will you'll understand, and I won't go too deeply into this, but the United States was founded for, on the whole premise of tax, you know, the taxation without representation. The taxation that, that created the uprising was a product of the British wars. They were attempting to pay back the debt they had accrued in the French and Indian Wars and all the other wars that, they, that had followed that. And the founding fathers believed that if you had a standing army, you would be tempted that that military would drive policy to justify its own existence. And as you can see in the last seven years, we've kind of seen that happen, but you know, we won't, won't get into that political argument. So you have a deep standing mistrust, or deep mistrust of a standing army. 1914, the United States was not a major military force. Uh, military spending was not a priority. In fact, it was frowned upon. And isolationism was the norm for the day. So by the time the United States entered World War I, the war in Europe had been raging for three years. Uh, we were way behind the curve on military technology. And most of the weapons that we would go to war with were European. So what made the United States stand out in, uh, at that point in time? We had what was called the American system of, of production. It, it was, you know, as, as the definition says up here, the uniform production of items made interchangeable components allowing manufacture with relatively unskilled labor. 
So we were able to build things in large quantities without a skilled craftsman workforce. You know, a lot of people refer to this as Fordism. You know, despite what popular culture says, Ford didn't actually invent the assembly line. He perfected it. He, he marketed it to the point where, you know, where it kind of became associated with him. But in reality, you know, Eli Whitney, Samuel Colt, Isaac Singer, McCormick, all these guys had major roles in it. So what was the origin of mass production? That's kind of interesting. The origin of mass production, you know, given the fact that the United States at that point in time was not a military power, the origin was actually military. The, uh, the, American, the Ordnance Department in the 1800s began looking for ways to make muskets cheaper and make them repairable in the field. And in the 1840s, they uh, really began to work on this pr prior to the 1840s, 1830s, right around your Mexican-American War. I guess we'll go back to that for a second. And uh, so the Springfield Arsenal really kind of kicked it off. And they were, by the time the Civil War came around, we were producing weapons that, were rel that had a relatively high interchange rate. And a lot of the European countries were sending their military attaches over here to study what we were doing. And uh, that will kind of play in. You know, the, the, um, they, they didn't pay attention to what happened during the Civil War. If they would have paid attention to what, the, what happened at the end of the Civil War, especially around Petersburg, World War I might have looked different. But they didn't really pay attention to the, to the tactics. But they definitely paid attention to our production capability and how we made things. So Michigan's contribution to World War I was, was incredibly significant. It was, it was varied. Because the auto industry was centered here in the st around the state of Michigan and around the Detroit area in particular, we had a lot of casting and machining capability and a lot of this kind of played in. So you had companies like Sparks and Whittington of Jackson that made hand grenade bodies. They didn't make actual hand grenades, but they made the casting. And then it would be sent somewhere else for the powder and the fuses. But they made the actual body that the, ex the you know, uh, a white star knitting made underwear, and I believe they also made underwear in World War II. Uh, Edmund Jones made uh, mess kits, meat cans, and uh, I mean, there's just way too many companies to really, I mean, we'd be here all night. There's books that are incredibly thick that cover this, the, these things. So we're gonna focus on a couple of, of the significant case, you know, case studies. So the first one I wanna talk about a little bit is Ford and the Eagle Boat. And there's your wonderful Eagle boat. So you got Henry Ford, he's kind of an interesting character. Uh, they call him the fighting pacifist. You know, anybody here know about Henry Ford and his peace ship? So yeah, Henry, he, he chartered a boat and went over to England and he was gonna, or went over to Europe and you know, was it 1914, 15, and he was gonna convince the Europeans to knock off this silliness and everybody play nice and it didn't, it was kind of a joke. They they made fun of him, and but he tried. You got to give the guy credit. At least he tried. Uh, but when the United States enters World War One, President Wilson summons him, calls, brings him to Washington. But his country's at war, and he says, "Well, I'm at war, and I'm behind it. I'm going to support my country." So the United States, we had, we were facing this new thing, the submarine warfare. And we had a great shortage of ships. And one of the ships that we really needed was anti-submarine capability. And uh, they wanted Ford to apply his knowledge of mass production to shipbuilding. And uh, like it says here, the Navy was looking at 21 different kinds of anti-submarine warfare ship at that point in time. And Ford was like, well, rather than building small quantities of 21, why don't we make large quantities of one? So we have the Eagle boat. So in January 1918, the Ford Water Company accepted the contract to build between 100 and 500 subchasers. And then you had a Navy design, you know, 200 feet long, 615 ton. And one of the important things to note, this, the ship itself was not designed by Ford. It was designed by the Navy. And then Ford made modifications to the design to, uh, to make it mass producible. One of the big things he did was to recommend that hulls be made from, from 
flat steel plates as opposed to rolled steel, which was the common for shipbuilding at the time, and well after that. Everybody said that was nuts. They're like, you can't do that. The ship will not be seaworthy. It won't, it just, it will not, you, it won't fare well in open seas. Well, he proved them wrong, actually. But Ford had built this little parcel of land over on the, this Rouge River over, not far from where we're at now. And uh, actually, for those of you who are familiar with the Rouge, the first building at the Rouge was built for the production of the Eagle Boats. Ford got the government to dredge the river. I mean, he, so he, he kind of cashed in. He, he used government money to kind of prep the land and build the slips and dredge the river. And so he was, he was thinking ahead. He wasn't, the, man was, the man wasn't dumb. He was a little bit nutty, but he wasn't dumb. So, like I said, he set out to build in January. So the contract was signed, and work on the hulls began at the Highland Park plant. You know, and they shuttled back and forth. But it's very much a foreshadowing of the bomber plant that we have, you know, just behind us or behind over here, is that the plant was being built and product was being built in the plant, and things were coming out of the plant before it was done. So you really kind of have this is your your lesson. You know, that this is your dress rehearsal. You know, they're, they're learning important, important facts here. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Eagle Boat never made it into combat. Uh, Eagle Boats 1 and 2 were accepted by the Navy prior to the armistice on the 11th of uh, November. Uh, shortly after the armistice, uh, 3 and 4 were signed well, on the 14th, so three days after the armistice. Uh, even though none of the boats saw action in combat, it was a remarkable feat. You know, in, like, you know, in 11 months, Ford took a design, he adapted it to mass production, built the assembly facility, and managed to produce four ships. I mean, a traditional, like, like we're saying up here, a traditional shipbuilder would have barely laid a keel in that time frame. So you had proof of concept, and, a lot, and the Eagle Boats did go on to serve in the post-war, and they did serve in open seas, and there are interviews out there with, pe with captains who sailed them in rough seas and said that they didn't behave any differently than a regular ship and that flat steel could be used to make a ship. Uh, I have a little note. So no Eagle Boats actually saw action in World War I. Eight Eagle Boats served in World War II, and they were primarily trainers. There was one Eagle Boat that was actually lost to enemy action, uh, Eagle Boat number 56, was sunk by a German torpedo off the coast of Maine in 1945. So it, it almost made it through the, through the Second World War, but it was lost at the end. Did Ford build all the Eagle Boats? Yes. And, the, and if anybody, anybody here read the book, Ford in the Service of America, that's an excellent book. It talks very in depth about this. And I mean, obviously, we're kind of, we're kind of scratching the surface of a lot of these topics because, I mean, you, we could talk all night just about the Eagle Boats. It was, it's actually kind of, a, it's an interesting story. So we got lessons learned. So let's see, we had proof of concept. You know, steel ships could be mass produced, they, and they could be seaworthy. And, you know, even though Ford didn't really venture back into shipbuilding, the concept was, was solid, and you had guys like Henry J. Kaiser in the Second World War that took the same idea, ran with it, produced mammoth numbers of vessels for, for World War II. All right, here's something I know you guys will like, aviation. Here, anybody, anybody name what we're going to talk about here for a minute? Liberty, and then uh, this guy over here, our de Havilland. How many people here knew that the de Havilands were built here in Detroit? Uh, well, you don't count. We know you. He's the World War I guy. We know, he knows. So the United States was the birthplace of powered flight. But after that, we kind of took a back seat, and the Europeans ran with it. The Europeans took off, and they ran with the whole idea. And the outbreak of World War I, they capitalized on the military potential of aircraft. I mean, we were, I mean, we had the Jenny, you know, we had a couple of Mexicans took a couple of pot shots at a Jenny, you know, chasing Pancho Villa. That was the full extent of our combat aircraft capability. Uh, 
and they, they were on the receiving end of the gunfire. So United States military aviation was pretty sad. Uh, it was relegated to being a section of the Signal Corps. And when we entered the war in 1917, 52 officers, 1,100 enlisted, 200. Uh, it's near and dear to my heart because I am a government civilian employee. Or, uh, so one, there were 200 of my fellow civilian, civilians working in the Air Corps at that time. And there were 26 certified pilots. And uh, yeah, our, we had really, we didn't have any, we didn't have a particularly good airplane. So we decided that we were going to go to war in European designs. And uh, the United States was going to manufacture aircraft that, that, that were primarily for training. Uh, the, the SPADs and the, and those aircraft, that, you know, like the SPAD you guys had, those were all built overseas. And they were given to the Americans to fight with. What we built here were aircraft that were relegated primarily to training. Not all of them, though. We'll talk about that in a second. So the focus would be on the, on the two models, uh, the Curtis JN4, our infamous Jenny, and the de Havilland DH4, which would eventually be repowered with the Liberty engine. And we'll talk about the Liberty in a little bit. Uh, so you had the American you know, Dayton Wright aircraft, Fisher body right here in Detroit, and Standard Aircraft Company would build you know, 4,846. Uh, 12, 1213, so 12, just about 1,200 of them were actually shipped to Europe and may have seen some combat action. And so what's kind of interesting is the, we made 4,800 DH-4s in a period of about 18 months. The de Havilland Aircraft Company produced 1,449 for the entire war. So American production, there's a reason why everybody was watching what, what we did. So DH-4, so this is a photograph. This is actually taken at the Fisher Body uh, plant down in it, right in downtown Detroit. And uh, I think we got a couple of them here. Yeah, this is, this is also down Fisher Body. This is most likely, I'm guessing from the looks of it, this was probably an aircraft that they used for training and familiarization, because uh, normally you wouldn't have the, the weapon mounted on an aircraft without the skin, but this is probably something they had sitting there for maybe for the big wigs to look at. Looks familiar, doesn't it? That picture uh, in there, uh, Willow Run, there, a picture that looks so, kind of similar to that. But there you go, there's your, there's your dress rehearsal. There's another, and this is actually, uh, you guys are getting this, this is, was not included in my original pre presentation of this down at the uh, World War I Symposium in Lansing, because this is, I recently learned about this. There was, an organization in Grand Rapids called the Grand Rapids Airplane Company. It was not actually a company in itself, but it was a conglomerate of 15 different furniture companies that combined their efforts and, were, and built 365 Handley Page 0400 bombers. Uh, the entire aircraft, with the exception of the engine, was manufactured in Grand Rapids. And uh, several of the O400s were shipped to England, but none were assembled in time to see action. So most of the things that, it, when I did the preliminary research for this, most of it, the documentation I found focused primarily on the, the DH-4s and the, J, and the JN-4s. But it wasn't until recently that I stumbled across, and this is information that came from the Grand Rapids uh, Library, is, so there's, this is something that there's more stuff to be found. What did the Hanley page look like? Got it. All right. <laughs> yeah. There's a <clears throat> So uh, to go back briefly to the, uh, to the DH-4, there were 1,600 DH-4s that were built here in Detroit at the Fisher Body Plant. So of that, 4,000, 1,600 were built here. Uh, one of the interesting things is in these, were, these may or may not have been uh, you know, American-built aircraft. But at the end of the war in 1918, the, the surviving de Havilland DH-4s in Europe were all brought together into one location in France, and they were all set on fire. And it got the nickname with the Europeans as the Billion Dollar Bonfire. So they, they gathered them all into one place and they torched them. Uh, 
Most of the DH-4s that, that were built here and were in the United States for training ended up being pressed into service as mail carriers. They were actually pretty popular aircraft. They were pretty, and uh, I guess the mail company or the mail service used quite a few of them. Oh, and then the Handley page was all, there were all, the, we talked briefly about, or mentioned briefly, the Standard Aircraft Company, which was somewhere on the East Coast. They also built some of the O400s. So it had a, two engines, one on the end of the fuselage and one offset? Or am I looking no, at it's that? offset. Yeah, there's two, yeah, twin engine. And this picture is, uh, this picture is from the Grand Rapids Library Collection. It's supposedly taken at, some, at an airport near Grand Rapids. Yeah, so it's clearly got American markings there on it. There was an airport in Grand Rapids that was downtown that they closed in about 1958. Yeah, yeah. it's possible. But uh, this is a this is a definite a topic that I want to kind of chase a little bit more, find out some more about it. Uh, I know there. I knew that there were grant companies in Grand Rapids that made propellers, because it you know it wasn't that much of a leap from going from wood furniture to wood propellers. And I, I knew that, and I was looking for some information on the propeller company. It was a thing that was, I forget who it was that made the propellers. And I came across this, and I was like, that's kind of interesting. I didn't know that. All right. So aviation engines is another area where, we, where the United States was definitely, and this is a, a place where we really made an impact. So... You can kind of see here the British are developing 37 different kind of engines. The French had 46 different engines. And the Germans had eight different engines. None of these engines could be classified as outstanding. They were average at best. So engines, they, they were still very much a craftsman society. The, Engines were assembled, the, the parts were made in, to rough specifications and everything was lovingly hand fit together by highly trained craftsmen and machinists. And it took a mammoth amount of time to build them. They, the, the Europeans came to us prior to the American entry into the war and were asking us to build their engines, very, very much like we would see with the, with, uh, the Packard and the, uh, the Merlin in World War II. They came, to, they came to us and to the American car companies and said, hey, we need engines. Can you build them for us? And much like you saw with the Merlin, we had the same problem. They, they sent us blueprints. And the blueprints were just, I, I, I'll use the work term soup sandwich. Uh, they're fun to look at, but messy when you dive into it. Uh, unclear specifications. There, I, there are cases, I, there was one case where I read on the Derone, on the Derone engine where they called out a material for the crankshaft that was clearly incorrect because the, the American, the engineers would say, if you made a crankshaft out of that, it would, it would fail in 20 seconds. You know, they had the, the incorrect call outs, vague sizes. So they, they realized that the best thing we can do this kind of sounds familiar, those familiar with the Packard story with the Merlin. It would be a lot easier just to go, go over to Europe, get an engine, bring it over here, tear it down, and reverse engineer it. So that's what they would do. But that takes time. It takes a lot of time. Especially, you think, back in 1914, there's no CAD. There's, you know, everything's done by hand. You know, this is a very time-consuming process. So... One example, the Hispano Suiza, I, I always pronounce that wrong, don't I? But it took 13 months to, uh, to reverse engineer it. It took eight months to reverse engineer the Larone. And we were building them. We were building them here. But it took, you know, once, but it took us time to get them reverse engineered and, and get it rolling. So the United States government does something intelligent. This, this word, no, no gasps, okay. The United States government does something relatively smart. They're like, you know what? We need to develop an engine. We need to make one engine. We need to make a good, not a good, we need to make a great engine. You know, we have the technology. It's a Lee Majors thing, isn't it? We can make it better, stronger, faster. 
So the United States government goes out and they pick probably two of the smartest guys that, that, that you can find. They go out onto the West Coast and they grab a guy named E.J. Hall, who was part of Hall Scott Motor. Anybody here familiar with Hall Scott? If you're, if you're a marine engine person, you'll know Hall Scott. They, they were the standard for marine engines for most of the, the 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, they, outstanding engines. So you have E.J. Hall, probably one of the smartest guys on, in the, on the planet as far as engine design. And then they go grab another guy named Jesse Vincent, who people in this area will probably know. He was from Packard Motor Car Company. Uh, Jesse Vincent, another genius. Uh, things on the car today that you take for granted all came out of that man's head. So this guy was, he, and he had been working on the Packard V12s, and he had been at working on the Packard aviation engine programs prior to this. Because Pack, Packard was dabbling in everything at that point in time. So they take Hall and Vincent and, and a couple of French aviation advisors. You know, it's, I always find it funny I talk, when, you, when we go through this presentation. Today, everybody kind of makes fun of the French. You know, in the military, you know, the French rifle you know, only dropped once, blah, 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 blah. At this, if you really look at this, and we'll, especially later when we get into the armaments, the French were the industry leaders at that time. They were the state of the air. They were the innovators. So we have some French aviation advisors, and we got Hall and Vincent and this uh, Colonel Deeds. I don't know, he probably pulled the short straw. And uh, in May 1917, they take him to a suite at the Willard Hotel in Washington, and they, they basically lock him in. And they're like, you guys need to develop us an engine. They decided to develop a family of engines that could be built as either four, six, eight, or 12s and the common design interchangeable components. They were, Colonel Deeds was given, uh, I'll say he was given the key to the Bureau of Standards and Patents and nothing was off the table. So they were, they said, beg, steal whatever technology you want from other companies. They even went to some, some of the enemy designs. The only thing they were told was Nothing experimental. We want you to take current technology, we want you to take the best of today's technology and combine it into one engine. So they took the crankshaft from you know, one company. I know they, they I, I think they took the camshaft designs from BMW. There's actually a really good book on the Liberty engine. It's, it's about this thick. And because uh, could, you could talk for weeks about the Liberty, but so they come out, and you have to remember, okay, May 1917, they go in. And by June, they had a design. So I remember, it took them eight months to reverse engineer that goofy Lerone engine. And in you know, four to six weeks, they have designed, and they have come up with a, with a design. They come back here to Detroit and they borrow 300 drafts. And remember, you know, we have no, no computers, no CAD, no CAM. They go out and this is all hand-drawn stuff. They, they go out and they get 300 draftsmen from all the car companies, you know, Packard, Cadillac, Pierce, Arrow, and they put them in a room and they say, okay, here's the engine. We're going we're gonna to draw it. We're going to design it. And the first eight-cylinder prototype was delivered on July 4th. So May, June, July from paper to running prototype in two months. So then they decided that they would center production of this engine in the Detroit area, and every single major auto company was involved in the production of it. Uh, we'll talk a little, this was a different, it was a different mindset at that time. The idea wasn't to have one company build a whole product. They would. They would each, different companies would build different components, and the government would assemble them. Was sort of the was the idea that they were running with it. Most of these were actually built as complete assemblies, but the idea was that you could have different companies build. You could have one company just build crankshafts, send them to a government arsenal, and they could assemble them. It didn't really happen that way, but that was the concept. So production numbers. They built two four cylinders. They weren't very popular. 52 six cylinders, 15 eight cylinders, 20,478 12 cylinders. And there's a Ford data plate. 
Oh, there's, there's old Hap, very first V12 delivered. Let's see what my next note is here. So, how many people here have heard of the Liberty engine before? All right, everybody, pretty much everybody. So you know that the Liberty engine basically changed engine design. It was, it was a trendsetter, and it would go on to be copied. It would, it, it would become the standard. Marine engines would copy it. The, the Soviets would copy it for their tank engine, the, the, the famous T-34s that it, everybody sees in World War II. The, engine, the V-12 that powered your T-34 was a direct descendant of the Liberty. The aviation engines would never be the same after this. This, is, this engine changed a, a lot of things, and it was truly an outstanding engine. So, I mean, we, we succeeded. Did, it, did a lot of them make it into combat? Not really, but we, act, we succeeded in what we, were, what we set out to do. Remember, the United States was only in World War I for 18 months, so a lot of the stuff was still on the boats. So we're going to talk a little bit now about armaments. On, on the Liberty, what was the horsepower of it, you know? Off the top of my head, I don't remember. Cubic inch displacement? I don't remember that. I, I need to add that to my notes. But yeah, it was a it was a good engine. What made it revolutionary? Overhead cams. It was just the the way they took the best of everything and put it into one package, and just the way it was done, the way it was designed, the mindset behind it was you know, made it made it revolutionary, and it made it it made it something that people wanted to copy. Uh, you know, the Packard 4M 2500s were were descended from it. They you know a lot. Of, and there were and because they made twenty thousand of them, a lot of them ended up in surplus post war. So they were out there. They were they were out there and they ended up all over the world. And so, you know, like the Russians, they the Russians were masters of copying things and they took it and and uh, you know, Miss America, you know, the Gar Wood loved them. You know. And what's interesting is I I believe it was Gar Wood w wanted Ford built ones, because he said the Ford built ones were better. He said Ford the Ford-built ones were better quality, so Gar Wood, for his racing applications, would, all, would seek out Ford-built ones. So armaments. Any, anybody know, anybody identify this, this weapon? Okay. 75 millimeter? That's the French 75 millimeter howitzer. You are correct. I'd give you a, I'd give you a prize, but I don't have any. Well, so, you know how I remember that? Because Curtis LeMay in ROTC had to study the ballistics of that thing, and he used that because it was the closest thing he had to make the uh, statistics on the 88 millimeter flak that he'd have. Oh yeah. And he said the chance of being hit by flak were uh, almost infinitesimal. You guys shouldn't be scared of it. And, and <laughs> he wrote that in his biography. It's not. It's, but it wasn't the flak. It was the shrapnel. <laughs> but. As we say, as, in, as was the case of the airplane, the United States was like was woefully behind the curve. We were, yeah, we were totally outpaced. Uh, so we decided to adopt the, the French 75, 155, 240, and then the British 9.2 inch gun. Uh, important note, the French 75 changed the face of warfare. Now a lot of people, Right. How many people, we'll do a little quick poll. World War I, trench warfare, what caused it? How many people here put the, say the machine gun? Nobody? All right, one in the back. How many people say it was artillery? Yeah, see, what well, he knows. World War I was an artillery war. And the French 75 was the reason why. 1897, those crazy French, never been fired, only dropped once, guys developed a 75 millimeter field gun that would absolutely positively change the way war would be fought. They created this thing called the recuperator. Uh, I, and I won't ask you what a recuperator does because it's right up there on the screen. Recuperator absorbs the firing, 
force of the weapon. Now, prior to this, you had the guns when you fired them, and you've probably all seen the pirate movies with you know, the rope tied around, and they fire the gun, and it goes scattering, skittering across the deck, or you've seen the Civil War guns where they fire them, and you know, the round goes that way, and the gun goes that way. The recuperator changed that. It allowed you to, fire, to lay a gun and fire round after round after round without relaying the gun. Hey, artillery, I'm using artillery terms here. You know what laying the gun means, right? Just want to make sure I'm not. <laughs> but you don't have to relay the gun all the time. You could play, position your gun, you could sight it in, and you could fire it. And you could get round after round on target with a, relative, with a high rate of fire, a high rate of accuracy. That is what drove World War I into a, stag into a stagnant. Well, the machine gun probably didn't help either, but our, the artillery definitely did. So, all right, we already did that one. So you, we got these, these crazy guys called the Dodge Brothers. They had just recently left, uh, left old Henry and split off on their own to start their own company in 1914. So they're, they're looking to put a name for themselves. So once again, we have the same situation. The, the French built recuperators one at a time, lovingly hand fit them, you know. The Dodge brothers took on, were the ones who took the task of making the recuperator mass producible. They did both the 75 and the 155. Uh, and they built the plant and very, very kind of very much like we see with Willow Run. Government owned, contractor operated, government funded, you know, and they built the plant in Detroit specifically for the 155 recuperator. And by the end of the war, they were making them at about 17 a day. Gun tubes here. You know, when the United States entered the war, we had, we had four tube making, you know, four facilities were capable of making a gun tube. Uh, I, bring, I put this one in here just because there was, once again, another case government-owned, contractor-operated, government-funded construction by Chalkis Manufacturing in downtown Detroit that was making the uh, three-inch anti-aircraft guns. And by the end of the war, they were producing them at three a day. So you have, you have this, the, once again, kind of a proof of concept that you would see in World War II with the tank plant, the bomber plant, the Hudson Naval Ordnance plant, the uh, Saginaw machine gun plant, but same model. Any army guys out here want to sing along? <laughs> so once again, we have the, you have these government arsenals, one of them happens to have been built here in Detroit, that were making the gun tubes. But once again, the car companies come in and they start, they look at parts of the artillery and say, a lot of this stuff isn't very different from cars. And especially with the caissons and the, the limbers and, and the shot trucks and things like that. So they begin producing those components out of auto plants. Uh, 75, one of the, probably one of the bigger ones was uh, American Car and Foundry, and they built the uh, caissons for the 75. And you can see they're mass, produ I mean, they're mass producing. What I think, it, one of the things that I always found interesting is if you look at the picture, even the camouflage pattern is standard. So they, so, the, you, we were producing things, and that, that would probably, you know, that's, that's 18 months at, at best. That's probably three, four years worth of production for a French company. And then we kind of, some of the things that were built here, American Car and Foundry, we just talked about. Dodge Brothers built the windlasses and shot trucks and rammer trucks. Ford, Ford built the caissons for the 4.7. Maxwell built limbers for the 155. Studebaker built uh, carriages. And we also made projectiles here. We made ammunition. I went, like we said earlier with the hand grenade bodies, auto companies had foundry capability and machining capability. So it was, an, it was not that difficult for these companies to go from casting engine blocks to casting artillery shells. And then, you know, you just... You have a list here. You can see it's just 
the variety of companies. Sparks and Withington is a company that will that'll reappear in World War II. They made a lot of bomb shackles. So your uh, your bomb releases in your B twenty in your B seventeen and your B twenty four may have been made by Sparks and Withington in World War II. You know, U.S. Radiator Wilson is another company that comes back. So I mean, you can see that in in the numbers, there's a lot of you know we made it wasn't like onesie twosie. There's there's big numbers here. Oops. Oh, I actually have the number. Let me bring it up here. And one of the interesting things about the French 75 is, is that uh, the British, the Germans, when it first came out, they made fun of it. They said it was too complicated. And by the time the war started, they had copied it. Um, so 3.5 million rounds of ammunition were made, here, were made during World War I. Uh, if you can look at World War II where we did billions. But Put a 75 in the B-25. Yeah, and it was the, that was the same weapon. A little bit of, I kind of like the poem. But, you know. <laughs> so actually, motorized transport is one of the areas where the United States was not behind the curve. Surprise, surprise. Uh, the, uh, we had actually dabbled with motor cars in the punitive expedition. And uh, the first documented test of a vehicle by the U.S. Army was done in, in uh, 1904. Uh, but it was not until 1912 that we really began looking at it seriously. Uh, Liberty Trucks. This was another one of those cases where the idea was not to have one company make the vehicle. It was to have a standardized design where components could be made by multiple companies, shipped to a government arsenal, and assembled. Didn't, it, it, it was a novel. It was a noble concept, but it didn't work real well. But... So in 1914, the government really starts looking at a vehicle, and they, ha they gather all these really smart people together, and they start designing a vehicle. You know, they get Packard, Page, General Motors. They all come together, and they design the truck, and they come up with, uh, they come up with the Liberty trucks. So you have the standard A and standard Bs. And there's, yeah, 3.5. And they actually began producing them, and, you know, 9,500 were made, 7,500 were sent overseas. It was a four-speed, 52 horsepower, 15 mile an hour. That's a, that's a fancy truck for 1914. And that's what it kind of looked like. There's still, there's still a few of them out there. So you had a, but then you have a lot of companies here in Michigan that, ma that are making parts for them. So on the B, they adopted a Packard-style uh, bonnet. Yeah. 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 You can see, if you look at it real closely, you have that list of companies that were involved in the design. You can kind of see where, where, the, where they picked stuff from. Yeah, Continental Motor, I mean, they, there's another company that had become big in World War II. McCord Manufacturing would become big in World War II for helmets. So, you know, all these companies get, get their teeth cut. But then, so you have the Liberties and this really grand, noble idea of these two standard trucks and everything's wonderful. But meanwhile, back in the real world, you know, Washington's running around in circles designing this truck. Meanwhile, you have the army, the military at that point in time was, was really, a, it was a mess. You, you didn't have a standardized ordering system. You had, everybody was doing their own thing. The aviation branch, the quartermaster branch, the ordnance branch, signal corps, they're all, they all have their own supply lines. They have their own governing bodies. They're placing orders. They're, you know, they're, they're, making, they're competing against each other. They're, ma they're making a mess. But you have, you know, <laughs> they up there. To, yeah, U.S. Army had over 200 makes of vehicles in their service, both domestic and foreign. And it, it, the supply system was, it was such a disaster that if a vehicle broke, you would just kind of leave it and go steal another one somewhere else, which those of you who have been around the military in a combat zone know that doesn't change a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, that was one of my jobs in Kuwait, is like going around and gathering up all the vehicles that had been stripped. I used to find the Humvees all the time with the hoods missing. Stupid hoods always broke. So, there's some numbers. 1917, we went into the war. We had, you know, 3,000 trucks, you know, 400 motorcycles, 
boom, end of the war, 85,000 trucks alone. And unlike World War II, civilian production did, never stopped during the war. So we, we pulled that off, making both military and civilian. So like we say in the conclusion here, the United States was involved 18, in World War I for 18 months. And so a lot of the stuff didn't make it over there, but it was a valuable, valuable tool. Because you got a lot of guys you, you see in World War I, you got this, this little, what was he, uh, assistant secretary to the Navy named Roosevelt. You know, he may have been in the corner taking notes and you had Bernie Baruch and all these guys that come back around. You know, they all, they learned, they, they, they had a valuable teaching tool here. One of the things that, that I like to kind of point out too is that when World War I ended, the United States government went to all these companies. So you see all this, this incredible work that was done. The United States went to these companies and said, war is over, contracts are canceled. And they stopped payment. And you had, so you see like those caissons lined up at, you know, at, and if they, if they hadn't been delivered yet, the government was like, yeah, we don't need those anymore. You can, whatever. And it created this deep rooted distrust of the government with, with industry that, would come back to haunt us in World War II. And you also had this headhunting campaign that went on at the end of World War I, where the, where the people, where the shift back to isolationism, where we looked and said, well, you know, these, these companies made blood money. They got rich off of this weapons of, of, of war and destruction, and, you know, the money has blood on it. And they went on this campaign to basically, to, to demonize all of these people that had stepped up to the plate and delivered. And then they also made it to the point where with the tax laws at the time, you couldn't idle a plant. You, you paid the same amount of taxes on a facility if it was producing stuff as you did as if it was sitting idle. So you had like on the East Coast, you had the steel mills that were created to, to meet the war demand. You had the, like we talked about the... Uh, the gun tube plant here in Detroit, you'll find nothing of that after the war. Because the minute the war was over, these companies went in and they bulldozed everything. They, they tore it down, they tore it, they bulldozed it because they did, the government was like, we're not gonna give you any more money. We're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna even honor the contract we signed with you. We're paying for what you delivered, anything else, is, it's your problem. And then we're gonna demonize you in the press and oh yeah, by the way, we're gonna tax the pants off of you on all this stuff that you built. So, I mean, they, they tore the stuff down, they bulldozed it, and when World War II comes around, you know, a lot of people, you know, I'll do my little soapbox for a second. A lot of people today are like, oh, you know, if we had to do it again, Today, we couldn't because all of our industrial capability has been shipped to India or whatever. We did the same thing at the end of World War I. We did it to ourselves, though. We didn't ship it off to another country. We taxed it to the point where the companies just tore it down. So we went into World War I or World War II at a serious disadvantage because of some of the stuff that was done here. And uh, that, that's a whole... That's a whole nother point, you know, a whole nother case study, and I, I know I'm running along here, so we won't, we won't go into that. You know, but that, that's an area of study that, that people really should look at, because it's, it's, you know, it's kind of crazy. But it's what the American people wanted. Yes, yes they exactly. They wanted to fight a war again. If we had no weapons, we could never fight again. Precisely. Precisely. But unfortunately, you know, that leaves a bad taste in the mouth of the people that you need when, when, you know, when the demon rises back up again and, and you need the weapons of war and they'll be like, yeah, last time you guys kind of screwed us over and we're, what are you gonna do? We want some, some... I have one little short here, it's kind of, kind of an addendum. How, anybody here know about the Austin Village? It's kind of one of my, it's one of my favorite things that, that, from World War I. Uh, Austin Motor Car Company in England, you know, was produced, created in 1905. And they, and this kind of goes back to, this is kind of an interesting connection back to the World War II in the, around here, in the housing situation. So, 
1914, they had 2,500 people. By 1918, Austin Motor Car Company had 22,000. A lot of them were women. And the British had a lot of corporate dormitories, and they, were, they had this thing, you know, women can't live in dormitories, it's bad. So you had all these new workers, and they needed a place to live. But transport was limited, so they, they wanted it close to the plant. Sounds familiar, doesn't it, Randy? Uh, but resources were also limited. They didn't have a lot of, they didn't have construction workers and lumber and all that good stuff. Also sounds familiar, right? So they, they, decide, they bought 120 acres uh, near the plant and decided to put up a housing. And it needed to be constructed. So what did they do? They came here and they purchased 200 prefabricated cedar board homes from the Aladdin Company in, uh, in Bay City. Now those of you, Aladdin was a big prefab company. That was a big thing at that time, the prefab houses. You could buy them from Sears and Munga Rewards and things like that. So it was, yeah, the cost of the order in place in 1916. And the houses were shipped across. Now there were two loads shipped across. One load was torpedoed and sank. So somewhere at the bottom of the North Atlantic, there's an entire village. <laughs> and, uh, but the other one made it. And on November 1917, the house, you know, so another great one, you know, December 1916 to November 1917, they had placed the order, shipped them across the ocean, and put them up. You know, today, we'd still be fighting with the EPA and OSHA. So, and they were occupied. Uh, they still exist today. This is the layout, of, this is the house they ordered, this is the layout. And yeah, they were not very big, but they, they had everything you needed. And that's what they looked like. And that's the layout. That's what the town looked like. And that's what they look like today. Well, actually, this picture, I think, was taken in like 2000. The British, uh, they, they, they consider this a historic town, and uh, they protect it and all that. And, and it's, uh, yeah, you don't mess with it. Now, how big were these houses? How many square feet? Um, let's go back here. So they were, yeah, 20 by 35. 700 square feet? Yeah. I mean, it's not, not a huge house, but, I mean, it's not, not uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought that's kind of an interesting contribution for the, the, of Michi you know, Michigan to the, to the World War I war effort. And it's a nice thing to close on, kind of upbeat. So uh, that, that's all I have. So I think... I guess, uh, any questions? Yeah, so where the, the, where the, the, in World War II, were the majority of the Merlin engines built here, rather than how many, did England build very many engines, or? Most no, the of actual them? numbers of the Merlin, that I don't, that I don't know. I don't know the top of my head, I'm sure. Packard built about 55,000 Merlin engines. I think they were the only licensed company to build the Merlin engine here in yeah. the U.S. Yeah. And it was a superior engine to the British engine. Yeah. I was I would just recently had the opportunity to go into that plant, oh, really? the Merl the Merlin plant. Yeah. It's next to the Packard plant, but it's not part of the. It's not it's not the devast. It's it's, it's inter it's sh yeah, it shares a wall with the devastated part of the plant. But that building is re relatively intact. I was able to uh, I got permission to to take a piece of the, the section of the floor because they're ripping the old wood wood block floor out. And putting cement floor in a, a prop, a Hollywood movie prop companies refinishing it, and they were ripping the floor out. And I, they were like, "Yeah, take as many of the damn things you want." So <laughs> that's kind of cool. That building, uh, I was up on the third and fourth floors, and the, the guys I was with described it as uh, "Mad Men meets uh, Walking Dead." <laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting. Well, any any other questions? Yes. Sir. Michigan's done a lot during the First World War, and I know the answer to this, but I just want to make sure everybody else does. But who besides you is telling the story of this? Because if Michigan doesn't have a World War I Centennial Commission, so I mean, we've got all these things that we did in World War II that people know a little bit about, like with the uh, museum here, but World War I, nobody's telling the story. It, the, it is an interesting question. I, I gave this lecture a few weeks ago, actually at our museum, 
and uh, Professor Charlie Hyde. I, most of you may, may be familiar with, Char with Professor Hyde. Yeah, Professor Hyde, who's written, who's probably one of the foremost researchers on the Ameri on automotive history, and he's done a lot of books on the arsenal of democracy and things like that. He came to hear me talk about this subject, and I honestly was incredibly intimidated. I, I took I took classes from Charlie Hyde back in the you know in at Wayne State years ago. I mean, he's been like one of my idols. And he was sitting in the audience, and I, he told me that he came to hear this lecture because as from far as he was concerned, I was the only person doing serious research on this subject. So I don't know if that an is that the answer you had? Basically, well, I think you're doing some of it, too. Yeah, I'm trying to do it, but Michigan doesn't have a board or one commission. Right. The historical <coughs> commission doesn't want to do anything. The governor doesn't want to do anything. And I mean, we've got a pretty good story to tell. It, it is it is an incredible story. And I mean, this is just a tiny, tiny portion of it. I mean, we've already gone an, about an hour and a half here, and I, you know, I don't want to make everybody go to sleep. But it, it, there, this, we're just kind of scratching the surface here. And every, and it's, well, Socrates knows, every time you know, I go back and do our little research archive or go off somewhere, I, I find something new that I, I'm like, well, I didn't, I, well, like the, the St Grand Rapids Aircraft Company. I just recently discovered that, and I was like. Wow. Well, there's a website of, of uh, abandoned airports. You ever been to that website? Yes, I have, and, actually. And, and I, I think if you go and look at the Grand Rapids area, they'll have pictures of that original airport in downtown yeah. Grand Rapids, and you might get some history that goes with that. Yeah. Um, a question, Henry Leland, familiar with him? Yes. Um, Mr. Cadillac, who sold it and then formed the Lincoln Company? Yes. Was he involved in building the Liberty Engine? Yes, he was. And he adopted that then to the Lincoln as a V8? I believe he did he did use that. There's a... there. There is a tremendous there's a there's a tremendous amount of urban legend that surrounds Leland in the in that I got I got called on it by a by a group of scholars at one point in time because I was using the urban legend in a in a presentation and and I found out that I was in fact wrong I, I was not it and that the, the the urban legend was that he left informed Lincoln because the, because there was the, this pacifist tendency. He wanted General Motors to be involved in the manufacture of the engine and they didn't want anything to do with the war effort. And then so he formed his own car company specifically to build the, the Liberty engine. There's a lot more to the story that that's it. There's a lot of urban legend that swirls around that. So, but yes, there, he was definitely involved in the Liberty and the, I'm sure he pirated some of the design from it. A lot of people did. I've got one other point I was just going to make is during World War I, the head of the Signal Corps, Major General George Owen Squire, was born and raised in Dryden, Michigan. And so he was the one that, he was working with the Wright brothers to get aviation into the U.S. Army. And so he was also the um, mm -hmm. guy who uh, patented multiplexing, which they use now for the internet. Right. Communications. So he's from Michigan, involved in yeah. aviation. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot there's a lot of connections to the state of Michigan. You know, obviously the World War II and the arsenal of democracy is the big story. There's a lot there, and it's we, there are still people alive who can relate directly to it. You know, World War One. There's not a lot of people left that have a direct connection to the story. And World War One to the Americans is not a big deal. World War One in Europe, it's a huge deal. I know when I was living in Germany, 1418 was, I mean, it just rolls off the people's tongue, you know, 1418, 1418, 1418. An entire generation of Europeans disappeared. I mean, an entire generation. It devastated the economy. It dev I mean, you look at England in the 20s and the 30s, there's, there's, there's just, there's, there's women. The men, you know, the men are either dead or maimed or damaged, you know. It, it's a huge, huge altering event for the Europeans. We were involved with it at a distance. We made some money off of it. We were actually directly involved for 18 months. Here, it's like, eh, okay. World War II is a much bigger, bigger event for us. So we don't really view it the same way, but it is a huge story. It's definitely a... a 
the dress rehearsal for what were to, was going to come later. Well, this explains the, the, the hangover that they had when they started to mobilize in World War II. None of the companies would spend any of their money to expand their facilities to right. to build equipment because they said, look what happened last time. Exactly. And and you still had the, the, the that crazy tax law was still on the books that wasn't repealed until much, until... Well, that was later. one of the things Knudsen got off the books yeah. in order to, to get the companies to come on. Yeah, that was one of the things that, it took them a while, too. I mean, And that's what, and that's how Willow Run came to be. Once they lifted that, that they would spend their money to build the factories. Exactly. They started building that stuff. So, I mean, you, you, you had industry, the industry, people, industry that was involved in war production was basically demonized, and they were punished. And yeah, World War II comes around and everybody Merchants sees it. of Death. Sender merchants, and I, merchants of merchants Death. Merchants of Death. Who yes. live on the blood profits of your son. Very exactly. There you go. But it, yeah, and it, it haunted us for a, for a while. And the fact that we were able to do what we did in World War II is, is just a testament to, well, it's a testament to what a nation can do when you, when you really kind of tick them off. So, <laughs> so, any other questions? A couple of people out there look like they're ready to go home. So. Well, they don't want to go home until they see who wins the money. All right. Okay, I had something to raise your hand. And please, I've grabbed some brochures from the table up there and, and come Somebody see raise it.